Welcome to the Painting Lines Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things tennis. Join Eric and Aiden in their discussion for updates on news and pop culture, and from hot takes to betting, they've got you covered. Ready? Play. Welcome back to Painting Lines. Last week, we gave our recap of the ATP World Tour Finals, and this week, with the season wrapping up and one of the final big events of the year happening, which was the Davis Cup Final Eight. We wanted to just kind of cover that and uh, talk about the eventual winner. So uh, if you aren't fully sure really what the Davis Cup is or the background of it, or you missed out on the earlier rounds of the tournament, you can check out episode 26, which was called the World Cup of Tennis, where we kind of gave a rundown of what the Davis Cup is and what was going on in the Davis Cup back in September when we recorded it. But without further ado, let's let's just jump right into it. So uh, the last eight teams were Canada, Finland, Australia, the Czech Republic, Italy, Netherlands, Serbia, and Great Britain. So Eric, were there any shockers to you of countries that were missing out or any of the ones that made it like stood out to you? Yeah, I mean, right off the bat, I'm thinking of the U.S. not making it. It was pretty interesting how during the ATP finals, when Kyrgios was on the tennis channel, he was talking to Corey about, you know, the drought of Australian and American players who have won a Grand Slam. And they were just kind of going back and forth and kind of concluded that the U.S. had more heavy hitters, more people, and had a better chance of someone winning a slam and all this. And then Now you see Australia was in the finals here in the Davis Cup and the U.S. didn't even make it or they didn't even qualify with the last eight teams. The American players, it seems stacked on paper, right? Like that's what you would think. And then Finland, I was pretty surprised about. I pretty much have just heard of Rusevori. So that that's a little of what stood out to me. Um, What do you think? Yeah, 100 percent. I think the funny thing about the Davis Cup is it really comes down to having two good singles players. Like that's why Canada was able to win it last year is because they had two good singles guys. They had FAA and Shapovalov. And as long as those two guys win their matches, they pretty much have like, they're just through to the next round. Whereas like in the U S it's like, yeah, we have a bunch of really good guys, but it doesn't matter that we have say eight guys in the top 75. It only really matters if we have two guys that can deliver in the, the big moments. Yeah, no, kind of going off that, it doesn't it seem like Great Britain's lineup, you know, it's like very average, very mediocre. Like they didn't have one guy who was really a standout, but then they also didn't have people that you've never heard of. There's just kind of middle of the road. Yeah, like Draper, Nori, guys like that were playing. Yeah, saw Dan Evans. Exactly. But like, yeah, nobody, nobody like Djokovic that's just like carrying mm. the team. Right. Yeah, so let's just jump right into... uh the quarterfinals. I mean, starting things off, the reigning champ Canada out in the quarters to Finland. I mean, honestly, it's not surprising because they're missing essentially their two top singles guys. I mean, there's an argument that Raonic could be one of their top two guys, but really Shapovalov and FAA are the guys that were massively important to them winning last year. And they're both missing. So the fact they got eliminated, yeah, it's not too shocking. I saw Shapo was enjoying the F1 in Abu Dhabi. So it's good that players can take this time to actually take time off and kind of enjoy themselves because there is going to be a pretty grueling eight to nine months coming up for these guys. Yeah, I mean, like we were talking about last week with with, uh, Alcaraz and Juan Carlos Ferrero saying the season is January to November which is just a crazy season. It's like how they always say the baseball season is so grueling because it's 162 games, except in tennis, you can't really take just days off like they do in baseball. It's like every week you pretty much have a tournament. You don't really get that much time to just like, okay, I'm going to take a break here. I'm going to take a break here. It's like, go, go, go. Yeah. And it's a weird dynamic too, where it's like, I guess you kind of could because it's all up to you whether or not you want to join a tournament or sign up for a tournament. I I don't really know. And you you kind of get that FOMO. Like once you start rolling, you don't want to stop. You don't want to lose your ranking. It's just, it's it's kind of exactly what I said, the FOMO. Like people just want to keep playing and playing, even though it's probably not best for them. But it's a weird thing where because you can choose what tournaments you want to play in technically, you end up playing more than what you would have otherwise, I think. Yeah, it's also like there's no downside of playing too many tournaments other right. than on your body, like breaking down. Like you, if you play in a tournament every week, 
you're collecting prize money every week. You're maybe collecting more points every week. Whereas if you skip a couple weeks, there's no benefit other than maybe you being able to recover a little bit. So I feel like guys weigh those options and they're like, why would I ever take a week off? Mm -hmm. Definitely. But yeah, uh, moving on to Australia, they uh, came back to beat the Czech Republic, which uh, I mean, I'm kind of shocked that the Czech Republic had the lead, but uh, yeah, Deminar was actually a tie break away from elimination in that uh, second match. And then he battled back one in three, forced the deciding match and uh, Australia took it in doubles. So I think uh, that was a, a big win for them. And I also think it kind of showed that I think Australia had a great doubles team. I mean, you have Max Purcell and Matthew Ebden, who uh, actually won the 2022 Wimbledon in doubles. So obviously they're good together, but also Ebden with his current partner, uh, Bopana, they were in the ATP finals for doubles. So that was a team that like, if you could force three games, I feel like Australia had a great chance to win that third match. Yeah, it's cool that they have like pretty much designated doubles players too. Like I feel like the other countries, maybe they just kind of threw their singles players together and told them to play doubles. But no, it actually helps when you have a cohesive unit that plays doubles often with each other. Exactly. Like Djokovic obviously is a great singles player and he's a great right. doubles player too, but he's not probably the same level in terms of the fine tuning that you have for doubles. Like he doesn't have that, like a lot of designated guys that are like double specialists have. Mm -hmm. Pretty funny. Uh, just quick story. I was home for Florida and during Thanksgiving break and I get a call from my mom. Hey, what are you doing right now? Oh, nothing. I just woke up. And she's like, I'm at the club. These three guys, they need a fourth. Their fourth just bailed. Like, can you come now? Like, yeah, sure. So I'm playing doubles. I don't really play doubles. And these guys are old, man, probably like 70, 75. And I'm just all over the court. Like, my partner, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, stay inside, do this, do that. And yeah. it was just kind of, I was in a blender, you know? Yeah. And when you're not used to playing doubles, it's like, it's hard to fit into like the dynamic of it sometimes. Yeah. And this dude was one of the guys on the other team was serving so slowly. I just kept slicing him back and I accidentally hit a drop shot back and he just like couldn't really run. And he <sighs> got kind of pissed. He's like, come on, man. Yeah. Playing with old people's fun. It's uh, there's an amount where you're like, I'm just going to try to work on my game. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. But then, so next quarterfinal match was Italy against the Netherlands. Uh, Netherlands made it. I think they were actually the one to eliminate the US. I think them and Finland were in that group. But uh, Italy kind of depended on Sinner because Arnaldi lost the opener to Van de Zanschop. And then Sinner like kind of comfortably just led his singles and doubles wins. Italy was just led by kind of one guy carrying them, it seemed like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like Sinner is kind of like the Italian hero right now. Yeah, and he's on fire in his recent matches. I mean, one in China, he won in Vienna, finals of the ATP finals, and then uh, obviously winning the Davis Cup is massive. And then uh, the last quarterfinal matchup was uh, Serbia beating Great Britain in four sets, so pretty handedly. And uh, I was wondering, like, do you think there's a, an impact of Murray missing just in terms of his energy that he brings? Obviously, he's so experienced. And he, he's played in these massive matches, even though he's not quite at the same level. You have Draper there replacing him. I don't know if Draper has the same experience in playing in massive matches. No, I get what you mean. I think Murray does bring the juice. And even though he is you know, older, he's not at his peak form, he still breaks out um, once in a while. Plus, I just love to see his grumpy ass out there on the court, too, because there's nothing like it, especially when he's like, working too, just running side to side doesn't win the point he just looks so you know defeated like you know snarling everywhere like, kicking <laughs> his shoes yeah it also but, might have been cool to see him play against Djokovic yeah I don't know if that would have been the matchup they would have had but ooh, I wonder yeah. like that would have been cool if they'd chosen to set it up that way well so do you would you happen to know their head to head or no I don't know it off the top of my head no let's see because I'm pretty curious like if I was gonna guess, I'd yeah, say if like you were to guess, let's thirteen see. to seven. So Djokovic leads twenty five to eleven. That's a close like ratio, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was, I thought it would be closer. I don't know. Djokovic is just. They, I I'm shocked they've played. What is that? Thirty six times. That's a yeah. lot. That's a lot of matches. <laughs> 
But uh, I guess it makes sense. Like when you look at it was the big four and it was like mm-hmm. always them in the quarterfinals. So, or the semifinals, I mean, so you're going to have a lot of matchups with those guys. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But yeah. So after that went on to the, the semifinals, Australia, pretty comfortable win over Finland. It honestly, to me, seemed like a pretty lucky draw for the Aussies because you had to beat Finland and you had to beat the Netherlands which are two teams where it's like, yeah, there's like one good guy. So if you can beat that one guy or if you can split, you can take in maybe the doubles. So I felt like it was a pretty lucky draw for Australia, but yeah, they moved on to the final. And then uh, Italy versus Serbia was really the heavyweight matchup. Kacmanovic took the first match in three after losing the first set in a tie break. And then he kind of just dominated the second and third sets. And then Djokovic versus Sinner, rematch of the World Tour Finals Championship. Djokovic loses the first set, comes back, takes the second set. It was, I think, 6-2, 2-6. And then in that third set, Djokovic has three break match points. He's up love 40 on Sinner's serve at 4-5. And then Sinner just clutches up on his serve, wins three, wins actually, I think, five, six points in a row, and then breaks... Djokovic's serve goes on, wins the third set 7-5. It was Djokovic's first Davis Cup singles loss since 2011. Whoa. Insane streak that gets broken. And it's crazy that it happened in this year where Djokovic had a pretty insane year and then loses in essentially his last match of the year. So a bummer for him, but a pretty crazy sign for Sinner. I feel like it's a great spot for Sinner to be in going to 2024. He's now beaten Djokovic twice in two weeks after never having beaten him before. Jeez. And then Sinner goes on to win in doubles against Djokovic and they knock them out. Yeah. So you were talking about the draw earlier. In your opinion, do you think if Serbia had played Australia? I just think this this draw made mm-hmm. it so that it was Serbia versus Italy was really like... Should have been the final. The final, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I get that. And then in the final, Italy clutches up Arnaldi takes this close win over Popperin and then Sinner just kind of beats down on Deminar. <laughs> yeah, what was going on there? I saw 6 0 the last set. I don't know. I think Sinner was just playing out of his mind, to be honest. And uh, honestly, I think Arnaldi's win was really important because, like I talked about earlier, that doubles team for Australia, I think, is really good. And Sinner was obviously playing doubles and he's on fire right now, but he's not a doubles player. And so I think if Arnaldi loses that match to Popperin and they go to that third uh, match in the tie. I think that Australia might actually pull out the Davis Cup win because I think their doubles team is pretty, pretty sick. What do you think about that matchup, though? Like, it was a very close match. Do you think Popperin is significantly better than Arnaldi or? I don't think he's necessarily significantly better. I think it was honestly a, a pretty close matchup in terms of skill. Probably just came down to Arnaldi dealing with the pressure more because in in the end, I think when you're that close in skill level, it probably comes down to the mental game and the nerves and being in that big moment of the Davis cup final and Arnaldi got it done. So, yeah. And just bringing up Popperin and Deminar, like those are the two top Australian players. Well, I mean, where's curious. Yeah. There you go, man. We didn't even mention Kyrgios. Yeah. Holy shit. If he was um, there, what maybe it would have been different. We don't oh know. my God. Yeah. I'm just thinking Popperin. I get he's gr- he's good, but he's not as good as Tommy Paul, Taylor Fritz, even Ben Shelton, I would say, or Tiafo. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... like if you look at like Canada's team, they had uh Gabriel Diallo playing, obviously. Uh Alafia talked about him. They were teammates at Kentucky, but like mm-hmm. Diallo's only like 200 in the world and he's playing in a singles match in the davis cup final eight not a great sign for canada that you don't have a guy in like the top 50 playing in that match yeah 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 all right you ready to hop into segments yeah let's do it all righty so uh what's new in tennis what'd you see this week dude i saw something pretty interesting uh an article about eight players that served over 500 aces during the 2023 atp season so we have Shelton, 505 for 50 matches. Bublik, 543, 48. Tsitsipas, 547, 71 matches. Medvedev, 547, 
in 84, Zverev 613, Rublev 616, Fritz 692, and then Hercotch 1031 aces in 69 matches. So nice. by far, by far and away the most efficient. And I don't know, just a couple of things that stuck out to me was obviously Hercotch. But then the fact that Djokovic, Alcaraz, and Sinner, like this year's top three players, were just not in the top eight in serving-wise. So it really makes you think if Sinner and Alcaraz could improve their serving game, how much better they're going to be. Yeah, I mean, Medvedev was on there. He's top top three, top four. Right, right. But I'm trying to think who else is surprising. I think Rublev is kind of surprising too. Hundred percent. Right. I think Rublev is a guy that definitely has a sneaky serve. You don't really think of him as a big serving guy. No, not at all. The fact that he's on there and he's got six hundred and sixteen aces out of eighty two matches, and then someone like Medvedev and Sitsipas five hundred and forty seven in. He has more aces than them, and those guys are guys that you kind of expect big serves from. Yeah, you think of because they're taller, bigger guys with more power. What do you think? I think yeah. If if. Center. I mean, we noticed Center's serve improving massively later on in the year. So I think we could see him on this list next year based mm-hmm. on how his serve has been improving. And I think that could be one of the parts of his game that pushes him up to the next level and makes him maybe like a contender to be the number one guy in the world. Mm-hmm, for sure. And another thing, I think Shelton, we could see over a thousand aces in 2024. Yeah, I think A, he's going to be playing more matches probably next year. And I think that Obviously, he's going to continue improving, and that's going to uh, part of his game is going to be improving is his serve. Yep, the lefty bomber. Exactly. All right, what did you see out there this week? Yeah, I mean, speaking of Shelton, I just saw that Shelton Musetti, neither one playing in the uh, next gen finals. And the big part of it that I was looking at was that there's a participation fee of $150,000, which is obviously a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And both of these guys seem like they're healthy. Like there's no stated physical issue I've heard about with Shelton and Musetti just played in the Davis cup. So he seems like he's healthy too. And it just seems like a lot of money to be missing out on for, I, I don't know what the reason is. Mm-hmm. I would say, I don't, I don't hate this position on, on their part because money aside, I think they have everything to lose, right? Because they already have all the prestige and the hype around them. So if they were to go in this tournament and not win, then it kind of brings down their value and it makes people think, oh, if you know these people are so good, why couldn't they even win the next gen finals? So to them, it's they're just probably sitting out because, you know, like I said, they have everything to lose, really nothing to gain. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Like for for some of the guys, it's like, oh, they win the next gen finals. It's like a stepping stone to bigger things. These guys have are already established. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you have a, I think we talked about this before where the underdog actually has less pressure going in because they're not expected to win. They go yeah. out there and play, they lose. That's fine. That's what was supposed to happen. So, whereas if you're the, you know, someone who's favorite, you may play tense, you may play tight. You may think like getting your head, Oh, I'm losing. I can't lose to this. It's a lot, a lot of mental stuff that's going on here. I think hundred percent. Yeah. I, I definitely see that. I mean, Fields will probably feel that because he's probably the top guy there now. Yeah, I feel like when you're the top guy, everyone's coming for you. Yeah. That's why it's so impressive that Djokovic is able to just fight off these guys. Yeah, hard to stay on top of the mountain. Mm-hmm. You said it. All right. Yeah, what's your bet of the week? Like I was saying with Field, I mean, I'm actually picking him. I feel like he's the massive favorite to win the next-gen finals, and so I'm taking him – plus 275 to win the next gen finals he's easily like the most established guy that is going there so i feel like he's the favorite to win and plus 275 pretty good odds because essentially you're betting on him to win like five matches which is a lot to win in a row but i think he can get it done yeah i I think so too for me i'm not really i don't know if it's the state i'm in or the app I'm using, DraftKings, I could not find any lines on the next gen finals. So I'm like scouring the internet to try to find this line. I got Stricker minus 260 over Kaboli. And I'm taking Stricker. It's pretty lopsided. I don't love the bet, but I do love Stricker because I think he made an impressive run in the US Open, beat Sitsipas, uh, made it to the round of 16, played a five setter against Fritz. So 
that's kind of when I first started noticing him. I know he's got a lot of power behind him, and this one's pretty funny, but just his build, he reminds me of Stan Bobrinka. He's Swiss, so always I love Stan, so I'm I'm just taking Stricker here. <laughs> Big Stan, those Swiss man, they enjoy their their food, their wine. <laughs> I guess that helps. The yeah, the, the chocolate and all that <laughs> yeah, stuff. The chocolate. Well, alrighty. Uh, what about a match of the week? Yeah, we touched on this earlier, but I'm going with Arnaldi over Poprin, uh, seven five two six six four. Or should I say Italy over Australia? Because when you watch the matches, it just says the country, right? You don't even <laughs> see the the players. But like we said, clutch win that you know helped contribute to this championship. It was a big moment for Arnaldi to step up with Berrettini being out, and he just hustled the hell out of him, dude. There is a lot of points where. Poprin should have won, but Arnaldi just made him hit the extra ball or, um, you know, got there when he probably shouldn't have. Uh, just super interesting to watch because when you do that, it just demoralizes the other person. And they're like, dude, why can I not hit a winner on him? Um, and also, he was kind of getting into the crowd too. He had like his hand up to his ear. He was having fun out there. So it's always fun to watch players who are actually enjoying themselves out there and having fun just kind of like a ben shelton yeah and then the last point i'm going to make here is i think it's always impressive when a player wins the first set and then loses the second but then comes back to win the match because i think at that point you're riding high after the first set all your momentum just gets blunted after you lose the second set and the way he lost to six two how does he come back and win that third set i think it's very impressive 100 percent. uh what was your match of the week my match of the week was uh the one we already talked about too, Sinner over Djokovic. And similar to what you said, it was a match where Sinner got that first set, lost 6-2 in the second, and then was able to come back. And, uh, I, yeah, Sinner jumps all over him early. Djokovic settles in, comes back, like kind of like he usually does. And Djokovic really seemed to have that match. I mean, when he's up 40-love, he's one of those guys you're like, he doesn't choke. And then – kind of chokes. I mean, Sinner clutches up on his serve, but you kind of expect Djokovic to be able to deliver in those moments, and that day he didn't. So, honestly, I think to me, kind of controversial, but I think right now Sinner's the best player in the world. I'm not saying over the course of 2023 he was the best player in the world, but I think right now in this moment, he just beat Djokovic two out of three times. He's on a three-set run beating Medvedev, beat Alcaraz, beat... Runa beat all these guys in like the last two months. Like, I think he's the best guy in the world right now. That's not a bad take. I, I agree with you. But we'll see what happens when we come back in the next year. Yeah. It's Australia. All these guys have gotten their rest and are healthy. Like, it's mm -hmm. going to be a, a new, like, setup for all these guys. I'm also excited for the new rivalry, too, because everyone was hyping up Alcaraz Djokovic rivalry. Now we have a center Djokovic rivalry officially. 100%. 100%. Center really, he's, fully bridged that gap he is one of the top there's mm -hmm. there is a, an established top four now yeah breakout year for him well, exactly all right and that's the show if you're not already subscribed go ahead and hit that subscribe button you can find us on instagram tiktok youtube at painting lines podcast feel free to shoot us a dm or email us any questions or thoughts at painting lines podcast at gmail.com